get started. Okay, what are we up to? Uh, 736, 7. 737. Yeah. yeah. From, from, yep. <laughs> Haven't had anybody in a few minutes, so. Okay, so uh, maybe you can keep an eye on the uh, people come on the waiting room. Okay, can someone check the chat as well? Uh, who's going to check the chat? Chris yeah. usually does it, but he's going to be busy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> maybe, maybe Nikolai, could you keep an eye on the chat? Okay, um, I'll start with an acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, of which the city of St. John's is the capital city, as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic. Today, these lands are home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We would also like to acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Mi'kmaq, Innu, Inuit, and Southern Inuit of this province. So welcome to the um, March 2022 meeting of the uh, St. John Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I'm Mike Morrow, I'm the president. And uh, a couple quick announcements as some of you may have heard on the radio, Sunday was the anniversary of Herschel's discovery of Uranus. So after the meeting, if you want to, to raise a toast to um, William and his sister, Carolyn, that would be a, appropriate. I noticed just before the meeting, that they had just released, um, I guess, the first image from the Webb telescope. There's a star mm -hmm. and some galaxies in the background. So that's pretty exciting. And Friday is going to be the maple sugar moon. So um, for those of you who have maple trees. So uh, our talk tonight is going to be from uh, Chris Stevenson about the uh, galaxies Fermi bubbles. He's going to tell us what that is, but in doing so, he's going to address the question, was the Milky Way once an active galactic, galactic an AGN, and lack, an active galactic <laughs> nucleus? There you go. There we are. Got it. Okay. Okay. And I think there are some visitors here. So welcome visitors. We're very happy to, to have you here. Um, if you found your way here, you know that you can get the links by emailing uh, info at stjohnsresc.ca. Um, we're happy to have you, whether you're members or not, but uh, if you do want to become members or think about it, uh, some of the things uh, you get with your membership is a supportive community. Um, basically, some of the people that are on the call with us right now that are ready to help you learn about astronomy. You don't have to be an expert um, at all to, to join the uh, the, the center. Um, you get access to a member chat group where it's very active, where people share their observations, talk about what's um, happening in the sky, um, share technical information. There are publications, um, Sky News, which is an excellent magazine, monthly magazine with uh, uh, information about what's up in the sky, the journal, which is a little more academic, the Observer's Handbook. Um, there's an opportunity for a very low cost to rent equipment. We've got seven telescopes, including one go-to, a few Dobsonians, a solar telescope, some accessories, so you can try before you decide if you if you are interested in getting um, a telescope. It's a way to try out different types of telescopes. And um, members can uh, get together for observing sessions in Butterpot and I think we're getting back to a situation where that's going to be possible more formally than we've been doing it. So um, I'll just mention that. Um, and members should be getting a monthly bulletin, which I've put the last one, the front page of the last one here, and a weekly newsletter. Um, if you're not getting those, let us know. Um, there is some useful information in there. Um, and so with that small amount of introduction, we're, we're ready to hear from Chris. And um, so his title is uh, The Galaxy's Fairy Bubbles Was the Milky Way Once an AGN? And I could read through the whole abstract, but Chris is going to tell us all about that. So Chris is uh, uh, an accomplished local astronomer, 
member um, and he's got training in astronomy. So I'll stop sharing and invite Chris to start sharing. Okay. And I'm looking forward to hearing the story about this. It's quite interesting. Uh, so, yeah. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk. I had two choices, spectroscopy, which I still can't get working, and <laughs> Fermi bubbles. Mike wanted to hear about Fermi bubbles. I was more than happy to oblige. Um, lots of reading uh, and uh, coming up to speed on this. Um, and it's, it's uh, pretty neat stuff. So, uh, the galaxy's Fermi bubbles. Uh, was the galaxy once an AGN? And AGN is short for Active Galactic Nucleus. And um, so we'll, uh, we'll get going. Um, uh, the Fermi comes from uh, the name of the telescope, uh, the satellite uh, telescope. Um, but it was uh, launched under a different name, um, as these things often are. Uh, and in June of 2008, NASA launched uh, its uh, modern successor to the Shuttle-era Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. And it was launched under the name GLAST, a very creative acronym for Gamma Ray Large Area Space Telescope. And um, there it is on a Delta rocket uh, leaving Florida. They, it, they spent a couple of months uh, shaking it out and doing tests and proving it, getting it working. And during this, it recorded a 95-hour first light exposure of the whole sky. Um, now, gamma ray telescopes typically look at large pieces of the sky because uh, they can't form tremendously sharp images. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, uh, but this was a vast improvement on previous uh, gamma ray telescopes. Uh, the uh, image is clear to see it's dominated by um, a diffuse gamma ray emission from the Milky Way's disk. We live in the disk, and of course, when we look out in the night sky, uh, what we see here, the orange, uh, we don't see gamma rays, but we do see the Milky Way, and it cuts across the sky, and it's very nice, and so on. So here it is in, in gamma rays, and that's largely due to uh, supernovae that go off of the disk throughout it, and the supernovae accelerate stuff, mostly hydrogen, i.e. protons, to uh, very high speeds, close to the speed of light, and we call them cosmic rays when they're that energetic. Um, these cosmic rays hit other hydrogen atoms in the interstellar I, uh, medium, that's ISM, uh, that forms particles called pions. The pions decay into muons, the muons decay into gamma rays. So that's where the gamma rays in the disk come from. Basically supernovae and pulsars and things. You can see here, uh, Fermi also sees uh, not only some pulsars in the disk, like the Crab Nebula here, the Crab Pulsar and something Gaminga and Vela, Vela but also some extraterrestrial sources. There's a blazer. That's a that's an AGN itself, actually. So this uh, this uh, astounding success uh, demanded that they rename the craft, the the satellite, and they named it after famous high energy physicist Enrico Fermi, and uh, the first person to suggest that uh, cosmic uh, particles could be accelerated to high speeds through astrophysical phenomenon. Uh, he's also the same Fermi that asked the question, were all the aliens? But that's another story. Uh, why space telescopes? Well, um, the Earth's atmosphere is actually opaque to a lot of electromagnetic radiation. We take it for granted that we can look up and see the night sky, but if we saw, if we had gamma ray vision, none of us are Superman, it's physically impossible anyway, but if we if we saw gamma rays, we wouldn't be able to see very far. Um, gamma rays are blocked by ozone in the atmosphere. Um, this is the older Compton Gamma Ray Observatory that the, in the cartoon. Uh, we can see optical, uh, we can see a little bit in the infrared. Uh, most of it's blocked. Uh, so to see in the far infrared, we launch satellites as well. A large part of the radio is visible from the ground, so we can build really big dishes. Radio photons are very weak, so you need to build huge telescopes to see anything. But really, really long wavelength radio waves are blocked. I think some people are thinking of building things on the moon to see that. So it's good that gamma rays are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere because that makes life possible down here on Earth. But it does mean that we need to launch our telescopes into space. So the uh, cartoon of the 
of the, the Fermi space satellite, uh, the gamma ray uh, satellite, um, nowhere on that do you see a traditional looking telescope. You see this box on the front end of it. And that doesn't look like a telescope to anybody, really, even when you look inside it. Um, so how does Fermi form images of gamma rays? Gamma rays are very energetic photons. They're the most energetic photons and they sail. You think X-rays have penetrating power. Gamma rays will sail right through everything. So it's a composed of, of two main parts, really. Um, there are these towers. There are 16 of them, four by four array of towers. And each tower is made up of trays of silicon strip detectors and and they're spaced and um, the idea here is as a gamma ray passes through the stack at presumably at an angle because it's coming from some direction um, each layer times very precisely I, I believe when it when and where it goes through that layer and all together you can trace the direction of the of the uh, gamma ray and at the bottom there's a uh, array of cesium iodide scintillation crystals which forms what we call a calorimeter. Calorimeters measure energy. So the, the gamma rays dump some of their energy into the, into the calorimeter and uh, uh, makes a flash in the scintillator. And the brightness of the flash is proportional to the energy of the gamma rays. So this thing can determine both the energy of the gamma rays and the direction on the sky they come from. So it's kind of like an imaging spectrometer for the most energetic photons. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And this thing basically just stares all and sweeps the sky and accumulates signal for long, long, long times. And so the longer, the better to get a better uh, signal to noise ratio. And anybody who takes long exposure photographs is familiar with that concept. By uh, 2010, researchers are starting to think of, of looking at the more sensitive data, Fermi data to look for things like, well, maybe, you know, dark matter particles annihilate that was uh, postulated and and the annihilation would presumably form gamma rays. So the distribution of dark matter was thought to be not very clumpy, sort of a general spherical haze or fog, maybe a little more dense towards the galactic center. That's sort of what you might expect to see in gamma rays if there's annihilations going on to form gamma rays. That's what they expected to see, sort of a fog of gamma rays. What they actually saw when they very carefully subtracted off the disks contribution that diffuse milky way contribution were a couple of sharp edged bubbles extending 25,000 kilometers or uh, new light years kilometers we wish up and down from the center of the galaxy this is that image um, they named these bubbles obviously fermi bubbles after the spacecraft that discovered them and I have a little video here. It's only about a minute long. I've only got one other video, so. Uh... Using data from NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, scientists have recently discovered a gigantic, mysterious structure in our galaxy. This never-before-seen feature looks like a pair of bubbles extending above and below our galaxy's center. These enormous gamma-ray-emitting lobes aren't immediately visible in the Fermi All-Sky Map. However, by processing the data, a group of scientists was able to bring these unexpected structures into sharp relief. Each lobe is 25,000 light-years tall, and the whole structure may be only a few million years old. Within the bubbles, extremely energetic electrons are interacting with lower energy light to create gamma rays, but right now, no one knows the source of these electrons. Are the bubbles remnants of a massive burst of star formation? Leftovers from an eruption by the supermassive black hole at our galaxy's center? Or did these forces work in tandem to produce them? Scientists aren't sure yet, but the more they learn about this amazing structure, the better we'll understand the Milky Way. Okay, let's recover. Stop sharing that. Start sharing that.
only have to do that one more time. Can everyone hear me? Yep, looks good. Can you hear you? All right. So, um, yeah, so again, Fermi, Fermi data includes both the directionality, where the photons are coming from, and also their energy. So you have a spectrum. And you can integrate over the bubbles and get a spectrum, gamma ray spectrum of the bubbles and the gamma ray spectrum of the diffuse light, the diffuse gamma rays from the disk and so on. Um, and it turns out the bubbles glow with a harder gamma ray spectrum than is coming from the disk. So it's different. So, so uh, the previous video alluded to the mechanism, um, uh, inverse Compton scattering, um, that made it easier to subtract. Um, and uh, this is a very busy graph. Uh, the blue is uh, the um, the bubble spectrum, and basically the uh, the red curve, the dotted red curve, you can take, for example, as as the diffuse. So um, another video I found has a much simpler, kinder, gentler version of that graphic, um, and I recommend you look at this clip. But it's 15 minutes long, and I'm not going to start it. It's, it's NASA PBS, and it's a nice sum up of this talk, parts of this talk. So if, uh, in the recording, you might want to track it down or you can just Google, Google um, was the Milky Way a quasar, PBS NASA. No, I did not steal the title from that, that clip. So inverse Compton scattering, um, if you have a field of uh, relativistic electrons, um, electrons with lots of energy moving close to the speed of light, uh, in an ambient uh, photon field, um, some uh, some of those photons will collide with the electron and uh, basically uh, carry off some of the electron's energy. Uh, so a low energy photon becomes a high energy photon, X-rays, gamma rays, and corresponding the electron slows down because it's just lost energy. So this is where the gamma rays come from in inverse Compton scattering. But what, as the video says, what created the... Uh, relativistic electrons and the candidates again um, a, a starburst somewhere near the nucleus of the galaxy because these bubbles are coming from the center of the galaxy um, or or the galaxy is an AGN and the, and the uh, black hole in AGN is actively feeding there's there's uh, what AGNs produce there so let's just uh, review a, a, a bit here we've observed bubbles uh, possibly similar to this in several other galaxies. So I'll start with M82. These are not gamma ray bubbles. These are actually hydrogen alpha bubbles. Um, hydrogen alpha is the red light from ionized hydrogen. It's the light you see in pretty pictures of galaxies and the red nebulae in the, in the arms. Uh, here the, uh, uh, you have two outflows of hydrogen, high velocity outflows in hydrogen, but that's hydrogen. That's, that's a visible light photo. And uh, it's thought caused by an outburst of star formation near the center um, due to a nearby pass from much larger M81, M81, M82 pair on the sky, a popular target for a lot of us. Um, so here's a Stellarium uh, slide. Uh, here's where the Cigar Galaxy M82 is called. 14 degrees south of that, almost due south as it turns out, is a Another spiral galaxy called, uh, well, NGC 3079, nicknamed the Phantom Frisbee Galaxy. And it's an active galaxy. It's an AGN. It's actually not that, it, it's surprisingly bright too. It's a, it's a magnitude 10.9. So it's, it's a photography fodder if anyone wants to take a picture of it. Hubble took some pictures of it up close and detailed. And it saw bubbles as well. So um, you can see, again, though, the, because this is Hubble, this is visible light. Um, NGC uh, 3079, again, is an, is an example of an AGN, and um, it's about 50 million light years away. It's an example of a weaker kind of AGN called a safer galaxy, where active galactic nuclei occur in spiral galaxies. Um, so uh, uh, the reason I'm, I, I wanted to show this picture, this is a, not taken by any of us, uh, I wish. Um, this is taken by fellow Dan Krausen, but an amateur astronomer. Up here is an example of an AGN that's amongst the furthest things you can see. 
Um, this is a gravitationally lensed quasar called the twin quasar or double quasar with the um, name QSO uh, quasi-stellar object 0957 plus 561, which is basically just the right ascension and declination coordinates rounded. Um, that's how they name things on the sky. Um, but the twin quasar, you can actually see this uh, in a, apparently in a 20 inch telescope with your own eyes, your retina, your retina can actually register the photons from this object, um, photons that predate the solar system. I need to try this sometime. There's really only one quasar. This is a gravitational lens about roughly halfway between us and this quasar is a intervening a massive galaxy. You can sort of see a orangey haze here. And the, the mass from that galaxy acts like a lens and rays of light that would normally diverge and you'd only see one of them are brought back together again. You can see both rays. And the effect is the same as a funhouse mirror, a bent, a bent funhouse mirror. So here you can see um, two faces. Obviously the person in the, does not have two different faces. It's only one face and same with this girl here. So quasars are on the opposite end of the AGN spectrum. They are phenomenally powerful things. So what is an AGN? Um, active galactic nucleus. Most, if not all, har galaxies harbor supermassive black holes at their centers. Things, millions of solar masses, or, or even hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of solar masses of material, well, of, well mass without material, it's a black hole. Um, so uh, what happens naturally? Uh, this, these are all at the center of galaxies. Galaxies are enormous um, mass of, of objects of mass. Gravity and friction interactions in the galaxy, some amount of that mass will fall towards the center and accumulate there. And uh, so um, in accumulating, uh, there's angular momentum. So everything is spinning. So it spins the accumulation into sort of a disk and a ring around it. The ring is sort of warm, the disk Friction heats up the disk, an accretion disk, uh, to phenomenally high temperatures. So there's a lot of light pressure going on in here, and that sort of holds everything up uh, in the inner parts. It's very, very hot, um, but some amount of matter still sips, seeps into the center, in, and there's where there's a supermassive black hole. And in getting near the black hole, it gets very, very hot indeed. There are very intense magnetic fields. They're still trying to work out exactly how these things work. I'll, um, so some amount of the material gets wound, caught up and shot off as jets up and down per, out of the rotational, of, along the rotational axis of the, uh, of the system. And these jets can extend off for, for hundreds of thousands of light years in, in larger AGN, uh, way outside of this. This is a very minuscule region of this galaxy. Um, the um, size of a black hole, if you will, is about three kilometers, the radius is about three kilometers times its mass in suns. So something that was a hundred million solar masses, which you'd think would be enormous, would be 600 million kilometers across, which sounds like a lot, but it's, you know, much smaller than our solar system. That's what, Jupiter's orbit or something similar to that? So this is a really, really tiny region uh, in space. What we see of an AGN depends on how we look at it. So, uh, and also on the mass for strong, for larger black holes. If we look at it uh, straight down the jet, we see a very bright jet and almost nothing of the rest of the galaxy. We see a blazer. Um, we see a quasar if we're looking more or less down the maw of the beast. If we're looking more or less towards one side. We're looking through the material of the torus around the black hole. We don't really see so much of the light, but we do see lots of radio in all these cases. So these are radio loud AGN. And then for the quieter examples, um, we uh, radio quieter examples, uh, they, uh, these are uh, found in, in spirals, safer galaxies um, are, are sort of the gentler version of AGNs. The Milky Way was probably a safer galaxy, on and off is a safer galaxy. So some real world examples of this. Again, NGC 3079 is a spiral galaxy with a supermassive black hole at center. It's called, it's a safer galaxy. Um, there are some nearby monsters. Uh, again, these things are radio bright and they go with names like Centaurus A. This is Centaurus A. That simply means, A means it's the brightest radio source in the constellation Centaurus back before they could resolve things. 
when they were cataloging a, a, a Virgo A, I think is M87, it's the brightest thing in, in Virgo. And again, these are all AGNs. They have these huge radio lobes uh, where the jets plow into the intergalactic medium and slow down and produce synchrotron radiation. And that makes them visible in the X-ray, uh, something called Bremsstrahlung when they, everything slows down. Um, of course, there's an optical galaxy there with stars as well. So, oops. Uh, sorry. So the model uh, holds up well. Um, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA in Chile, Las Campanas, or the Atacama Desert story, um, observed uh, the Taurus, the gas Taurus itself, actually, um, in uh, 2018, I think it was, in uh, the Seyfert Galaxy M77. And uh, here uh, is its observation. The, it's shown as green. Uh, of course, it's, it's millimeter wave uh, radiation from molecules. In this case, the molecule is hydrogen cyanide, so don't go breathing it. Um, the other uh, um, form, oh, what's the other molecule? HCO, I think it is, plus it's an ion. So if we zoom into that, there's the supermassive black hole around all, all around which this is spinning. The black hole, the, the material around immediately around the black hole is spinning very fast. And you can see Doppler shifting. Part of the disk is rotating towards us. That's diagrammed here as blue. Parts rotating away from us. And that's diagrammed here as red. Red shift, blue shift. So it's nice to actually see this. Um, the, uh, the model seems to be born out in reality. So getting back to the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way itself is also radio bright, if you look right in the center. And using the naming nomenclature, well, Sagittarius A. If you look in the direction of Sagittarius, which is looking towards the center of our galaxy, um, there's a bright source there. Here's a very large array uh, image um, taken in the 1990s, maybe, um, of the center of our galaxy. Most of these blobby ring-shaped things are supernovae remnants. This is the plane of the galaxy here. There are some interesting towers and thread-like arches and things. But then there's this really bright blob in the middle. That's Sagittarius A. If you look even closer to Sagittarius A, the, the blob, say in X-rays, um, the Chandra X-ray telescope uh, took this image um, some time ago now. Uh, there's a bright, bright point source, Sagittarius A star. Um, where a lot of emission is coming from. A lot of these other points are pulsars and probably very, very hot stars that are luminous in X-rays. Because there seems to be, most galaxies have black holes in their center. This makes sense that there would be a black hole here. We understand black holes to be the, the engines of AGN. So maybe this is where the Milky Ways is. It's all, you know, it was all very theoretical for a while, but then in the last decade or so, it was actually proven. Telescope technology got better and better, and we could start resolving things right down into the central uh, arc second, tiny fractions of an arc second. And if we look at the center of the galaxy at 2.2 uh, microns in the infrared to see through the dust, use adaptive optics so we can sharpen up the stellar images, uh, we can monitor the motions of a bunch of stars, fast motions, orbiting something very, very massive. Uh, Andrea Gez and her group at UCLA, the uh, Galactic Center Group, um, and also uh, Reinhard Gensel um, at ESO's VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Um, as Gensel is a member of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Um, both uh, teams imaged stars going around something, said to Terry say star, for years. Star S02 has become somewhat famous because it's actually been followed all the way around, a, a complete orbit around whatever it is orbiting. Uh, it has a period of 16.17 years. It's been monitored for two decades, uh, since 1995, so by now over two decades. So um, there is just nothing else in, in, in the theoretical analog that, that this could be other than a black hole. And here's the other movie clip I want to show you. A very recent clip. Uh, this is from just just this past Christmas. 
um, from the ESO group. And um, so uh, having learned my lesson the first time, I'm going to show this now in just a second. Um, uh, because we know the distance to the center of the galaxy, we know the angular sizes of all of this stuff, the, the angular size of the orbits, and, the, and we can, of course, we time it, we know the period. It's elementary physics to, to calculate the mass of what the star is orbiting, given the assumption that it's much, much, much more massive than, than the star. You know, Kepler's laws will do it. And um, we know the mass is just over 4 million solar masses. So that's our black hole. Now I'm going to show this video by stopping the share and changing it. that sorry folks Well, maybe I'll uh, try and play it again. I'm getting rattled here. I'm going to go back to uh, showing the presentation. We back in the presentation? Are we back in the presentation? Yes, you are. Okay. Anyway, basically, you see these things moving around. Anyway, for this achievement, um, both groups, uh, Gez and Reinhardt, uh, shared the Nobel Prize in 2020 with Roger Penrose down here. And he was the one who proposed the existence of black holes in the first place in 1965. So it's a pretty big deal. Black holes are real, as best as we can tell. Now, we talked about that Taurus... Uh, we know there's a warm ring of uh, molecular gas at the center of our own galaxy as well. I'm not going to present many, many slides about that. But there's, um, in 2011, 2012, um, it became clear to a bunch of people that maybe one of these, there's a cloud called G2 um, that they were thinking might actually be sucked into or be consumed by, I guess, Sagittarius A star. And um, there was a lot of excitement. It turned out that G2... Um, Here's an image uh, in 2006, 2010, 2012, and so on. And uh, it missed. It actually didn't get consumed, so it's, it survived. A very close passage, but it slowed down. And that gave them some information about the density of the material about a thousand event horizon radii out. So the event horizon for our black hole is 4 million times 3 kilometers, so 12 million kilometers away, so well within the orbit of Mercury. This is going to, uh, it's had energy taken from it, slowed down. So this is, this is expected now to swoop back and do try again, but this time it won't survive and it'll, it'll fall into the black hole. So we're looking at this cloud falling to the black hole sometime in the 2150s. So that's a given. That's going to happen. Gez's group also uh, recorded um, uh, some flare-ups in Sagittarius A star, A star. You can see activity. Every, occasionally it does flare up. Now these are tiny, feeble little things compared to what we think of as an AGN, but there's sort of a simmering activity all along. But does it, did did A star ever have a feast, a banquet, and you know produce jets and all all the all that good stuff, AGN stuff? Again, back to our our uh, Fermi bubbles. Here's a cartoon showing the extent of them, 50,000 light years from top to bottom. And um, there were X-ray uh, emissions detected uh, before the bubbles were discovered. Uh, the X-ray telescope ROSAT saw what it thought, what were concluded to be uh, ionization cusps or cones, um, not complete bubbles, just the bright parts, the lower parts. So that, that was a known feature at the, the time of discovery as well. But uh, this is, again, this is the picture as of about 2010. And the race was on to figure out what on earth is going on here. I mean, 
you can make some assumptions. Yes, it's a black hole, et cetera, et cetera, but maybe not. Maybe it was a, 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 a nuclear starburst. We want to know. Uh, other pass bands, um, the WMAP and uh, Planck uh, satellites, uh, cosmic uh, microwave background satellites, um, also saw emission, a, a microwave fog in and around the center uh, where the bubbles are. Here's a February 12, 2012 uh, release by the Planck team. And you can see the, uh, the haze there. That's Planck. Um, also in 2012, uh, astronomers at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics announced that they think they're jets. Um, this is an artist's depiction. And uh, to me, anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the actual jet part is not conspicuous in gamma rays. And in fact, I, I think they're still looking for them. I think what they did was they concluded from hot spots in the, in the, uh, the, near the wall of the, blue, the, the bubbles um, that their jets impinging on that part of the bubble. The jet seems to be, uh, the jet seem to be inclined 15 degrees to the plane of the galaxy, which implies directly that the rotational axis of a black hole is inclined 15 degrees to the plane of the galaxy. Jets, AGN, looking better. This is fun. So um, in about 2015, uh, researchers used uh, the Hubble Space Telescope to actually probe the velocity structure of the northern bubble. They did this by looking at a distant quasar through the bubble um, and uh, looking at ultraviolet light. And the quasar in question was the PDS 456, only one. And uh, they looked for absorption of the, of the uh, ultraviolet light and a, a key line or two. And they noted how the uh, rest wavelength of that absorption feature was shifted by the velocity along the line of sight of the, of the material in the bubble doing the absorbing. So the near part of the bubble would be moving towards us because the bubble is expanding. Here we are. And the far part of the bubble would be, would be moving away from us. And so it's, it's, uh, it's not actually red and blue, but red is the red shifted part and blue is the blue shifted part. And um, so you know, here's the neutral, here's the red shifted wave uh, absorption feature and the blue shifted absorption feature. So you can actually measure the expansion velocity of the bubbles and they got an answer of about 3 million kilometers an hour. So you can work backwards. The bubbles are roughly 2 million years old. Whatever happened to produce them happened about 2 million years ago. This feat was repeated in the optical for our good old uh, red hydrogen alpha light by the Wilkinson H alpha mapping telescope or WAM. What a great acronym, acronym that is. Normally, when you telescopes go wham, they break. This one works very well. Um, and they looked at more than one quasar. They looked at 43, I think it was. Um, but they saw basically the same thing. Expansion velocities calculated. They got the same answer, about two, uh, two million year old bubbles. The fact that uh, you could determine, make a measurement like this for something that is actually optically invisible is, is pretty impressive to me. So just like our giant radio galaxies, um, we know that the center of the galaxy is, is radio bright, but if you look carefully, do you actually see bubbles? I mean, that radio image from the VLA never had bubbles in it. Um, that was taken at a wavelength of 90 centimeters. But what if you look at a slightly higher energy, um, 23 centimeters, roughly four times the energy um, of radio photons. The uh, brand new uh, South African meerkat I forget, KAT is the Karoo um, Astronomical Telescope, I think it's named after the, the desert it's in. Um, uh, it's an array of uh, many, many dishes. There it is down here. And so here's an image taken by Meerkat at 23 centimeters. And lo and behold, there are bubbles. These are not the same size as the Fermi bubbles. They are not the Fermi bubbles. They are different. They're much smaller. These are only about uh, 1,400 light years tall, not 25,000 and about 460 across. They're probably also uh, synchrotron radiation, just like for giant radio galaxy lobes, however. AGN again, looking very, uh, very encouraging. Um, in 2019, a uh, Russian astronomy satellite um, 
uh, Spectre RG, anyway, was launched uh, to the second Lagrange point um, where the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is. So a segue to hopefully a, an image I'm looking forward to seeing after the talk. Um, uh, it's nice and quiet out there, of course. Uh, excellent place to look at very, very, very faint sources. So aboard uh, this is uh, Germany's E. Rose, Rosita. And that's an acronym for something, and I'm not even going to try and guess what it is. We'll just call it E. Rosita. Um, X-ray telescope that's sensitive to energies higher than, than um, our earlier X-ray telescope, Rosat, and so on. And uh, so what did it see? Very sensitive. In June of 2020, its all-sky image made the uh, photo astro astronomy photo of the day. Very photogenic thing. And look at this image. It's loaded with stuff. Um, so there are, here's the Orion Nebula in X-rays. Um, you know, around the trapezium, it's pretty hot. You'll, you, yeah, you, you'll see X-rays there. The large Mag Magellanic Cloud and X-rays, the four next cluster, entire galaxy clusters, very extragalactic. The intracluster gas in, in galaxy, large galaxy clusters can actually be millions of degrees, which is how you get X-rays, and so on. Um, Cassiopeia A, another supernova revenant, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, very conspicuous are these huge radio bubbles. Uh, radio, uh, X-ray bubbles, excuse me. These are roughly not quite twice the size of the Fermi bubbles. They are gigantic. They extend to about 80 degrees up and down from the from the plane of the uh, of the galaxy. You cannot see them with your eye, of course. If you could, they would dominate the sky. They named them Erosita bubbles, of course, um, named after the satellite that saw them. Uh, the color coding here, um, blue corresponds to the highest, to the lowest, sorry, blue to the highest energy uh, X-rays, 2.3 keVs, and red to the lowest energy, 0.3 keVs, and green to somewhere in between. Here's an over plot of the red Fermi bubbles in gamma rays and the cyan blue colored Erosita bubbles, um, and you can tell that they're much larger. But they are all centered on one another. They're all nested together. The question is, are these things related? They certainly seem to be. And are they from more one event or many events? And if they're from many events, why are they so different from one another? They must be from one event. Very recently, this paper only came out last week. Procrastination and putting talks together pays off sometimes. Um, this, uh, this paper only came out on March 9th, and uh, Karen Yang and, and her bunch um, uh, were running, uh, ran uh, extent, uh, very detailed modern hydrodynamic models to simulate the, um, an AGN event, um, pumping a jet into the, uh, into the area around, uh, in the galaxy around, uh, near, near the black hole, into the galactic halo, halo and, and watching what happened. And um, they, they managed to do it. With a single event, they twiddled the parameters, and they determined that about 2.6 million years ago, if uh, you pumped about 1,000 to 10,000 uh, solar masses of material into the jets, um, the, uh, high, the relativistic matter interacted with the... Uh, galactic halo, you've got your inverse Compton scattering producing the gamma rays. And you, um, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, the, uh, you generated, um, as this material is plowing into the, to the uh, halo, um, it, it's doing so supersonically, so you get shocks, and those shocks um, ripple out through, uh, compressing as they go, and the, the, the front, the compression front, is extremely hot, millions of kelvins, and that emits your X-rays. That's where the Rosita bubbles come from. And um, again, the mechanism, uh, Bremsstrahlung, or breaking radiation in German, um, the uh, microwave fog uh, t t closer to the center is uh, possibly, um, again, um, th these uh, electrons, uh, fast electrons spiraling around their strong magnetic fields in the center around the, around the black hole. That could also be synchrotron radiation. Um, anyway, the key thing here is one event could do duplicate all of this, and, and it duplicates it rather well, actually. So this is pretty much the nail in the coffin. Um, this Milky Way galaxy was an AGN 
about 2.6 million years ago and was for about 100,000 years. And it produces all the structures that we see today. And we mentioned the radio, the very small radio lobes, but you know, jets again, um, plowing into material and generating radio lobes. There's another piece of evidence too. Um, you've probably heard of the Magellanic Stream, the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds uh, visible from the Southern Hemisphere um, have uh, pulled out from them by gravitational interaction with the uh, Milky Way uh, and each other. Um, large streams of material and some stars. Um, and it's uh, called the Magellanic Stream. And it's uh, there's enhanced ionization in the stream, roughly where it's over the plane of the galaxy. Um, and this is entirely consistent um, with uh, it being ionized um, by uh, emanations from the center of the galaxy. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope actually did uh, UV spectroscopy of uh, the Magellanic Extreme in this region and saw the presence of, of uh, silicon with three electrons removed, well ionized silicon and carbon, carbon uh, four and silicon four, and uh, four electrons, I'm sorry. And, um, and so you don't get that unless you have a, a powerful ionization source. So again, AGN. So the question naturally is at this point, okay, so the galaxy has been an AGN. Will it be again? Yeah, probably in 2150. Uh, depends on how massive G2 really is. But um, 1,000 to 10,000 solar masses of material is not actually a whole lot um, in the grand scheme of things. So maybe G2 will cause this to happen again. Uh, should be, we be afraid? Uh, are we in peril if this happens again? And um, I think the, uh, the the clue to that, the answer to that is already in the fact that these bubbles and beams and cones and all of this is directed away from the plane. We live in the plane. Sorry, I'm skipping to the answer. Um, people naturally think about extinction events when they when they see this stuff. It looks pretty nasty and uh, there's lots and lots of chatter online. And um, the answers are usually always the same, but you know, let, let's just follow this for a second. Here's a Wikipedia stuff, a Wikipedia page on extinction events, and we see, um, you know, the late Devonian here, and, and the the uh, the event that killed the dinosaurs right here, 66 million years ago, and the Triassic Jurassic extinction event here. During each one of these things, you know. 50-ish percent of all families and 80% of all species or something like that are killed off by something. Usually volcanoes uh, causing enormous uh, uh, nuclear winters and, and, and or uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and so on and so forth. There's one, not, no, no majors at 2 million years ago, only 2 million years ago, but there is a minor one uh, listed in Wikipedia called the Pliocene Pleistocene boundary extinction. And if Phil was there, he might ask the question and talk a bit more about this because Wikipedia doesn't know anything about it. Um, somebody thinks it's possibly due to a supernova, which turns out to be much more likely than than AGN activity. So the answer is simply only a couple of slides left. The answer pretty quickly is, yeah, we really have nothing to worry about. We're in the disk. The uh, material of the disk focuses um, the, uh, these bubbles up and away, uh, from the disc, uh, of course the bubbles are formed by jets, which are themselves, um, asymmetric, uh, asymmetric, symmetrically formed by the central black hole. It's not a spherical distribution of stuff. It's, it, it all is already, um, aligned, um, roughly to perpendicular to the, uh, the, the galactic disc by the fact that the black hole is spinning so much and the jets go along the axis, the spin axis. It's away from the disc. It's not towards us. Um, we're safe. We're 8.1 kiloparsecs or 26 and a half thousand, uh, light years away from the center where all the activity is happening and the activity is happening in a region that's only a couple hundred uh, light years across, if that. Our atmosphere also has lots of ozone in it and that'll block any gamma rays that are floating around out there. To be honest, the gamma rays from our own sun are vastly more powerful than what we're seeing from this. 
of much greater concern is a would be a hypernova or supernova in our own solar neighborhood and we've all been very afraid of betelgeuse blowing up the last a few years ago a couple of years ago um betelgeuse is 600 light years away that's even too far um so uh this is the last slide um the uh, a group uh, just for the fun of it i guess um at uh University of Illinois Urbana uh, Champaign, a uh, group led by Brian Fields, um, did some modeling again with hydrodynamic uh, code. Uh, what would happen if a supernova blew up only 65 light years from the sun and thus the Earth? Uh, here's a picture from their results. Uh, the sun is that dot, the blue dotted line is the Earth's orbit. And you can see how everything is squashed over, and at some point, they saw that it would take a supernova 65 light years away in order to strip the ozone layer from the earth and you need to do that in order to cause an extinction event so you need to be as close as 65 ish light years uh, with a supernova in order to really inflict nastiness on the surface of the earth uh, you could uh, when i first read this paper i got it backwards i thought maybe they saw anomalous uh, uh, isotope ratios of plutonium and samarium uh, in rocks um, dating to the Devonian extinction, but no, they're still looking for evidence of that. But in any case, it was an interesting exercise. Amongst the species that died in the late Devonian extinction were these things called placoderms, bony armored fish. Bye-bye, placoderms, no more of those anymore. But 65 light years is not 27,000 light years, so we're safe. Sagittarius A-star can do whatever it wants to do. And there is one extra slide, and I almost wasn't going to show it, but the visual pun implied by Milky Way and Double Bubble is just irresistible. <laughs> so there it is. Um, Sandra and Miriam thought this was funny. My apologies to the makers of these candies. So uh, thanks very much. Thank, thank Chris. Um, however you can do it. Uh, um, so that was great, Chris. A lot of information there. Uh, I'm uh, really, really glad we uh, pegged you to do this. And um, we've got time for uh, a couple of questions. And while people are thinking of them, uh, maybe I'll start with a question because I got the floor. Um, so these um bubbles that are seen in the different wavelengths and you showed that they could do a, a computational um you know do some modeling and show that they could all come from the same event um are people trying to measure the using the red shift and the blue shift like they did for the actual fermi bubbles um uh, trying I mean, are there ways for people to try and uh, figure out the expansion rate for the bubbles they're seeing in other um, wavelengths and see if they all extrapolate back to the same couple million years? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure it's even a concept to look at X-ray absorption in a thin gas, a thin plasma, maybe if there's enough of it. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I am, of course, by no means an expert. I just read the papers and try and make sense of it. But that would be an interesting thing to try. I'm, I'm not sure how you go about it for x-ray because that's strictly an emission thing. Yeah. Um, um, oh. And presumably microwave uh, as well um yeah even doing it for one of the wavelengths would be interesting and we, we've got a couple other questions here yep. um yep. mark asks at its peak would anything be visible from earth in the optical at its peak uh at 2.2 microns definitely uh you saw I don't know if I should share the screen again. Um, you saw the um, UCLA Keck group of those simmering of Sagittarius A uh, uh, sort of simmering um, 
Yeah. Uh, that's that's not visible, but it's close to visible. And um, yeah, so I mean, if if the uh, if the AGN was much more active, you presumably see more of that. Um, you're already seeing we're already seeing some of it. Let's uh, let's hop in here and I can't even see my own slides clearly here. Here we go. So yeah. Um, okay. This, yeah. This this GIF will play, and you can actually see Sagittarius A star in 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 this two point two micron image. So yeah, if it was more active, you would see it 2.2 microns, probably not in the visible um, mm -hmm. because there's so much dust in the way. Um, this uh, this region is, is more or less obscured by dust in, in the optic, in the optical, which is about half a micron wavelength. So this is four times the wavelength that we're looking through here. You might see something, you might see a little bit. Um, okay, got, got another question. Yeah. Or a comment. This is from John. Um, not sure which John, but I can guess. Um, just a comment. If this was an AGN event that happened 2.6 million years ago, then it could be visible now or just now um, to somebody watching from Andromeda, from the Andromeda galaxy, which is sort of interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, and Robert asked, do they have an estimate of the mass of Sagittarius A? I think you. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Typing didn't work proper. My question was for the mass of the cloud in orbit of Sagittarius A. So this is the one that's oh, going to get sucked in. Um, I can look that up. Um, it's it's of the order of of uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of solar masses. These as these things are, it's it's not a pinpoint. Um, okay. I don't think it's millions. These clouds typically are the sorts of things that if they're cooler and more remote from a black hole, uh, something that would warm it up. If they, if they, the, the inner parts of the cloud get cold enough, they'll just spontaneously collapse. And that's where stars are formed. And stars usually form in, in the thousands. Um, even the Orion Nebula, which is nearby, but it's, it looks big because it's nearby, but it's actually a small H2 region. Um, it's only powered by one star really. And, uh, you can tell just by casually looking at it in your telescope eyepiece, there are many stars in there. So I can look that up, actually. It'd be interesting. Okay. Um, so uh, last call, any other questions? Uh, people can put them in the chat or, or unmute and yell. Yeah, let's see. Uh, I have a quick question. Okay, Yolanta. Yeah, uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, the bubbles uh, coming out from our Milky Way, but are there any galaxies in the neighborhood who that have an act AGN right now that maybe uh, uh, have bubbles pointing towards their, you know, Milky Way? Well, um, there's one uh, early in an earlier slide um, that blazer. Any blazar is one that you're looking right down the jet at. And um, although it's already in full output mode, if you will. Um, off the top of my head, uh, I don't think so. Um, you basically have to be aligned very well. And um, our local group is Virgo would be uh, the next closest group of large group of galaxies. And um, the brightest thing there is is uh, again M M87 and that jet that uh, we saw is more or less side on. Oh. And um, come on. And not we're not looking straight at it. So um, uh, again, it's much the same as as the case uh, with. Um, supernova or hypernova you'd have to be really really close by in order to for it to do damage um and unfortunately i don't have an answer for you i i, I don't think so i think we're pretty safe in, in in intergalactic terms i don't think there's anything near enough 
um, that it would be a threat because it would have to be oriented properly in order to be a, a serious threat. If you look at these things side on, that's fine. Um, it, it's just sort of a light show. Uh, it, it has to be something like a blazar in order to be dangerous. And I don't think there are any blazers that are especially close. I think the closest one um, that's that's active was uh, in that um, that uh, first light uh, image, that guy. So 3C454. Okay. Four, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's thank Chris again. That was uh, uh, a lot of information, a very informative talk, and uh, very, you know, a lot to think about there. And uh, um, uh, I, I thought you. that was great. So thank you very much, Chris. And Good fun. Very, very well presented, very clear. So I'm going to share again now and uh, go into some member observations. And uh, <clears throat> so again, I've I've harvested images from the uh, the group chat, uh, the member group chat. But if anybody wants to jump in with some visual observations, uh, just let me know somewhere along the line. Um, and we've got quite a few of them. I guess that's a sign that we're starting to get a little bit more good good weather. So um, I'd ask the people if they're commenting about some of their images to try and be fairly concise. Um, yeah. So the first one I've got, so I've got them again in chronological order. So I think this was actually the night of our, can, can you see my images here? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, Jim's um, uh, Max Maxitov uh, telescope objective, which I've got a picture here, and I guess this was his first try with it. Uh, the details are there, and he got a picture of the moon. So anything else you wanted to say about this? Jim, I know it's been quite a... Uh, uh, Quite an exercise trying to get it working right. This 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 uh, is uh, this telescope is actually uh, marketed as a telephoto lens. It's at a very awkward uh, focal length of eleven hundred millimeters, um, which makes it uh, too short for some things and too long for others. So um, it's uh, it's an optic that's basically easy to take apart and and put back together again. And I've done that trying to get it to work for astronomical, but it's it's designed mostly for terrestrial use. So uh, I've only taken a few pictures with it because uh, we haven't had much good weather for taking shots. So um, this is the only shot I've got of an astronomical object. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, say this is terrific, um, but it's not bad. Yep, great. Okay, thanks. It's a cheap um, telescope. <laughs> It's an interesting one. So uh, yeah, so this was also um, the night of the uh, last meeting. And uh, so I think we got the full moon that night, which uh, I got a picture of, um, which may satisfy one of Nikolai's uh, challenges. Um, and the next night, Sue Hart took a picture of the moon in clouds. I don't think Sue's here. She's in Whitehorse right now. Um, I'll just listen for a second. I don't hear Sue. Yeah, so anyways, that was just a cell phone picture, but uh, very interesting effect. And then there are two pictures here that uh, uh, Chris did with a, um, uh, I guess with a new filter. So maybe Chris, you can uh, say a little bit about uh, um, the narrow band and then putting yep. it all together. Just just a few words. I've, I've talked enough. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I bought this big monochrome camera uh, last year um, for, for for doing science and lots of pixels monochrome, though. And um, so I can do spectroscopy. And um, uh, I took it out and tried to take pictures of it a couple of times, but really needed filters. So I got a filter holder. I asked Sandra Claus for a filter holder, got it eventually. 
and uh, put some filters I, I had uh, for a, a Canon, these uh, clip-in filters from Astronomic. I had kicking around unused for a decade because it was just too awkward to put them into a Canon DSLR and then take it out and put it back in and then try and align up in, on the same target again. So I could put them in the filter wheel, it turned out, and I tried them out. I also bought a, uh, a very, very narrow uh, H-alpha filter, only three nanometer band paths. And um, the reason for that was, well, it's very, very good at chopping out the full moon. Uh, if you want to take photographs of H, uh, H alpha and things, it doesn't matter whether it's full moon or new moon. Um, and um, also I have a 12 nanometer H alpha filter and I was thinking, well, there's also nitrogen emission in, around those features and you could subtract one image for the other to get just the nitrogen. But anyway, so this first image is good old Orion Nebula through the three nanometer filter and it's, I forget, it's a bunch of exposures. They weren't very long exposures, uh, 60 seconds, 30 seconds exposures. And there was a couple dozen of them. Um, and this was, uh, uh, this was guided and 12-inch um, telescope in the backyard. So, um, yeah, you can see they're hardly, the stars are hardly evident at all. And the trapezium uh, is uh, very well resolved, actually, in this. Um, because there, it, nothing's burnt out with starlight. And so this is kind of cool. Um, first light worked out really well. And then I, I tried, I uh, repeated the, well, I have four filters. And so this is the result from the other three. The 12 nanometer filters, those, those astronomic filters, um, reduced each one and um, each pack of uh, images. Jim Johnston does a lot of this stuff. This is a uh, Hubble palette stuff. This is my first whack at it, believe it or not, after all this time. And uh, with a with a very forgiving bright object, um, the Orion Nebula. And uh, I didn't rigorously calibrate <coughs> anything. I just adjusted things uh, uh, by by hand and uh, aligned and added up and it looked pretty, so yay. There, there is an arc on the bottom here because there's something shiny in the light path and I need to paint it with black paint, but otherwise, yay. Thanks. Okay, very good. Yeah, looks nice. Thanks. Um, Robert, uh, this is yeah. your uh, Horsehead and uh, Flame Nebula from February 20th. Yeah. Well, as you can see, uh, to be very concise, uh, there was six, just six images, uh, three minutes each. Um, here in Mount Pearl, uh, using a, um, I think it's a seven, no, it's a, it's a HA and O3 uh, dually filter by, I think, Optolan. And uh, anyway, uh, this is what I got. Yep, the horse head looks really sharp. I really like that. Yeah, I was surprised it came out as well, but uh, it's great. You got to try it, or you don't know what you could what you can do. We got a lot of failures, but sometimes it works out. Okay, good. And this is also yours, the um, Leo triplet. Yeah, not so. Uh, uh, dust not, not so not so great with the dust donuts uh, in the. Uh, in the image there, as you can see. Uh, so my lack of uh, uh, flat flat exposures to no to nullify uh, those uh, specks or those dust uh, on the uh, image train would have been nice to have. But oh uh, well, that's it. But, it. but it marks it marks the beginning of galaxy season. Yep. Yep. Okay, and John, um, you want to unmute and tell us? So John is just getting started um, with astrophotography. He's got a camera. He's not tracking yet, and uh, but he's he's started with the uh, Orion Nebula. And why don't you tell us a bit about uh, what you got here? Um, yeah, so I think that's my third time out at the Orion Nebula. Um, down in the right corner there is the, there's a tree actually just blowing back and forth. Um, I just figured I'd give it a shot anyways, because I uh, wanted to try out the new exposure time. 
from my previous uh, term at us. And then I guess the green type of color then washed over the whole thing in the tree, trying to bring out all the colors. Yep, okay. well, it's a, it's a good start. And uh, that's what you have to do is, is start. You, you, you can certainly see that the nebula is there. So uh, congratulations on uh, your first, first nebulae. And uh, I'm sure you'll progress pretty quickly as you uh, work along. So that's a good start. Hey, that, that's yeah. that's great. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the club. It's a rabbit hole. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, and and we got a uh, bunch of things from uh, Bernard. So is Bar Bernard? I think Bernard's there. Yep. There he is. So uh, we got the Markarian chain, and uh, the details are there. Anything uh, you want to point out about this one? There's there's a, a few galaxies in there. Uh, we'll wait for everybody to count them. That'll take the rest of the night. Uh, well, uh, I took that with my, uh, I guess, Boyd Field Telescope. Uh, sharp star I have, a 61 uh, millimeter, 275 millimeter focal length. Uh, so yep. mounted on top of the... Uh, the me telescope that I have, the Helix 200. And uh, what does it say? Uh, three minute exposures and uh, uh, darks, but I never had any flats for this one. So I didn't have a, a flat panel for that one there, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, turned out pretty good. Uh, first time ever trying that that one. Okay, I'll, I'll point out to people who haven't seen Bernard's work before he's, um, Oh, where, where are you, Bernard? You're out in central. Yeah, I'm near Lewisport. Near Lewisport. And he's got an observatory and some good stuff. Uh, so let's see. The next one is uh, also the Leo triplet. And uh, so similar setup, I guess. Yes, it is on this one. Yes. Okay, yep. Very nice. Uh, these are amazingly flat for no no flat field corrections. Um, <laughs> I, I envy you your skies, Bernard. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's you know it's pretty good. Sometimes a uh, certain type uh, certain type of sky, I guess, or you get some. I get some light from the Lewis town of Lewisport there, but it seems like some nights is worse than others. Even though this is a clear sky, I don't really know why, but uh, that seems like the way it happens. It might just be haze. And uh, so. here's uh, Bernard's Rosette Nebula, which is sort of up and to the left of Orion, right? Yes, yeah. And uh, Yeah, I, this is my first time uh, using a uh, filter. I had a L enhanced filter, and that's the first time I've ever tried one of those. And uh, So what, what does this one, um, what's the band pass on this one? I'm not quite sure, Chris. You probably would know uh, that uh, there's two two bands on that one. I think. Robert, is this the same dually that you used? Um, if he's got the uh, L enhance, yes, um, it's a wider, uh, more forgiving band pass of uh, I think eleven or twelve nanometers. Whereas mine is a bit sharper than that. You know, cutting the cutting the light uh, band pass down to, I think, seven, I think. Yes. These are filters okay. that for color cameras and they let through hydrogen alpha and oxygen, red hydrogen alpha and also green oxygen uh, at the same time, which to me still blows my mind, even though I know how it's done. But it's, uh, yeah, so people with color cameras can do narrow band imaging. It's very, very neat. Yeah, very nice. and. Uh, just just the right uh, focal length for that object. Okay, and uh, Randy, do you want to say a little bit about this? Uh, that was uh, March 6th. That was the afternoon of a, one of our storms lately. Um, started out as just a big, uh, you know, ring around the sun, but you can start to see some of the parahelic uh, um, circle goes across and up over the top and, um, so I've seen better than those, but that's not bad for that. 
Yeah. So there's you see, you see sun dogs there too. Is it, yeah. Uh, well, that's part of the circle. Yeah. Yeah, the perihelion circle. There's stuff on the top as well that uh, sort of a, a flat top halo on the top. But uh, yeah, really Classic interesting. Classic sign shot. that storm's coming. Pardon? Classic sign that a storm is coming. Yeah. And there was. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can say that every second day. But yeah, we should see a lot of them. <laughs> so, Robert, this was uh, your shot of the sun. Oh, yeah, 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 it was uh, through the center's um, PST, um, hydrogen alpha solar uh, scope, and uh, had a lot of trouble uh, trying to uh, get the camera and get focus and get the tuning. Uh, and get drivers and the software all working at the same time. So <laughs> it was a hard fought image. But, but you got really nice prominences. The, the sun yeah, is getting to be a lot of fun. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And uh, I'm on the cusp of making a purchase for a solar, solar scope. Well, good luck. Mm -hmm. So this was my night. You know, the last week we actually had a couple nights in a row that were um, nice. So I got a shot of the moon um, just before um, the quarter and maybe at the quarter. Uh, so you, so these are roughly 24 hours apart. You can see how much the uh, Terminator has moved in one day. So I thought that was sort of fun. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and and John did um, the moon the same the, the first night, so that's John's shot. Uh, did you want to say anything about this one, John? Again, a great great shot. So things are um, the moon's always a great thing to image, and uh, your camera seems to be working well for that. Yeah, no, I didn't really uh, have much to say on that one. Okay. I'm gonna take work. a few. I must take a few moon shots. I don't really remember which one that was now. Yeah, I forget which day March 9th was. Let's see. No, it's nice. It's a nice photo. Yeah. That would have been last Wednesday. Yeah. I can subtract seven from sixteen. Okay, so Chris, here's um, uh, M101. I've got stuff at the top of my screen, but I think this M101, right? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was typing something to Marcellus. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about, I, I have been trying the, uh, the same Hubble pellet, uh, trick with, uh, with the Galaxy M101 above the handle of the Big Dipper. Um, back in my past, I, I did, uh, astrophysics spectroscopy on, on all the giant H2 regions, the nebulae in the arms of this thing. So I know there's lots of nebulosity and I just want to take a, a Hubble pellet image of it. Um, this is, uh. Uh, data that before I took tried taking some flat fields, so it's not even properly flat fielded. Uh, I just crudely tried to take the vignetting out of the corners. I'm shooting from light polluted St. John's, right? So um, my images are uh, even through narrowband filters, and this is a 12 nanometer filter, not the three. Probably would have been okay with the three, with the 12 deep vignetting in the corners. Some of that's still there, but anyway, you can see uh, mostly most of the light is is nebulae. Uh, not stars. So. so you're going to be doing uh, other bands with this one and putting them together? Yep. Now that I've uh, finished uh, preparing a certain talk and, and delivered it, so I'll have time to uh, <laughs> go out and actually do some astronomy. Okay, great. Thanks. And uh, there were lots of uh, very positive comments when Bernard posted this one. So uh, this is Bernard Sombrero, Galaxy. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I did that one with the, uh, the ASI, uh, 294 MC Pro, uh, that was, uh, with the Mead LX200, uh, and this was a 6.3 reducer, or 0.63 reducer, I should say. I think that worked out to nine, 1920 millimeter focal length. Yeah, uh, last time I was to the observatory, uh, I was trying to figure out what to 
image, and I did see that one uh, coming up on the on the hap I had there, uh, Sky Safari. So I thought I'd try it. It was wasn't Glad really uh, it wasn't really that high. Uh, it's still a bit low, but uh, uh, it I think it worked out good. Now the image was a nice bit bigger than that, and uh, and I cropped it down a fair bit. And yeah, it's a pretty small object. Yeah, and I made the stars smaller, so you know, a uh, fair bit of processing and. Sometimes I wonder how much processing is really you're supposed to do, but uh, but uh, that's that's what turned out. So anyway, it looks good. Okay, good, very nice. Bernard, Bernard I'd like to say uh, that uh, when you get a chance, uh, see if you can uh, use the same equipment uh, for uh, NGC four five six five, which is like a needle. Uh, and it's up around uh, Virgo, so after after midnight, perhaps, uh, or uh, a little earlier as uh, as the spring progresses, you get it a bit earlier in the night sky. But I'd love to see you do that one with uh, with the LX two hundred. Okay, so that's uh, four five NGC four five six five. Four yeah. five six five. Okay, I'll I'll check that out next time. Yeah. Thanks. And this is M51, just below the uh, handle of the Big Dipper. Beautiful. Wow. Yep, yeah, that one turned out pretty good as well. Uh, did a fair bit of processing on it with Pix Insight, which I'm starting to learn. But, uh, you know, again, sometimes I wonder, you know, is it too much or, or, or what? Because I'm, I'm just getting new to this, but... Uh, you can go overboard with it uh, sometimes, but uh, I, I think this is tasteful. Yeah, you've re you've really brought out all the tidal stuff, all the the the, the haze of stars that have been pulled out of the the, the interacting galaxy. Um, that's really that's amazing, actually. Yep, beautiful. Um, nice job. Okay. Yep. Thanks, guys. And uh, this is Jim's. Uh, M101. Yeah, this is taken with a uh, an ordinary camera setup running. Uh, basically, it's a modified Sony camera and a telephoto 500 millimeter telephoto lens, uh, dating back to the 1980s, um, with a with a teleconverter to to extend the focal length. So, uh, with galaxies, you need to get as much reach as you can. This isn't in the class of the Schmidt Cassegrains that we've been seeing from Bernard, but um, this is a, basically uh, a process I've been following for the last few years uh, to automate uh, the capture of these images. So this has been, uh, this was actually a hundred three minute exposures. So it's a total of five hours exposure and it was all run while I was uh, sleeping happily in my bed. So. Uh, it was an automatic, uh, automated procedure, and it's something I've been working on for uh, for a while now, and it seemed to work really well on this particular evening. So it was actually very cold, and uh, and uh, once I got the uh, things started, I was able to do things from my kitchen table. So, um, so yeah, a lot of work went into getting to this point. Um, and now I just need some more uh, more clear skies and. Um, there's lots of background galaxies that are uh, also available here. You can see in this particular, there's there's that lentic, there's a sort of flying saucer shaped, uh, uh, and then there's uh, several um, irregular galaxies uh, scattered throughout the field of view. So we're looking out of the plane of our galaxy and towards the the darkness of galactic intergalactic space. Yep, in this beginning of galaxy season. That's right. Okay, here's another one from Robert, M42. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, that's M42. Um, again, uh, could uh, use uh, some flat field uh, shots to uh, cut down on some of the Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. And uh, and uh, Leo Triplet, I guess the same night. 
uh, again, you're, you're seem to be uh, less trouble with the uh, dust bunnies in this one. Uh, and Jim took a shot with the uh, his lunt, and there's a sunspot there. But I guess it was a bit of a challenge tuning it up. So I guess Jim's you're learning how to do this one. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to. I got blindsided by this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll answer Robert's question. He says, "Where? Why? Why is this uh, such a bright red?" And that is because the the Lunt has the an H alpha, a very, very, very extremely narrow H alpha filter. So, um, so yeah, it cuts out most of the light. And uh, so we're just basically imaging the the uh, emissions from H alpha in this particular picture. Okay. So um, thanks everybody for your pictures. And now I'll invite uh, Nikolai to jump in and I'll stop sharing. And so Nikolai, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, take it away. Uh, sure. And before I do that, let me talk for a minute about something that's not on the agenda, but it is pertinent. And since I'm the, the observing director, it, it's definitely pertinent for tonight. And that's uh, something that um, some members keep asking me about, especially Robert. And that's how to look at a satellite image uh, and interpret that. And since everyone knows that the forecast is calling for clear night tonight, uh, I thought I would show you the satellite. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. So in blue here, that's the outline of Newfoundland. Uh, so the reason I think it's important to look at the satellite and not just at the forecast is that ultimately what you see on the satellite um, overrides anything that you see on the forecast. So, you know, all of the forecasts right now are calling for clear sky tonight. Uh, but, you know, you, you, to, to, make it, to make sure that that's the case, you go to and look at the satellite. So what do we see right now here? Uh, and this is an infrared image where uh, temperature uh, is, is the determinant in what you see. And so the, the brighter colors are colder temperatures, the, war the uh, fainter colors are warmer temperatures. And so right now, we're right here, you do see that these uh, brighter colored clouds are clearing us. So those are high clouds because they're colder, higher in the atmosphere. So that's good. And then you see the next system coming in from the west again with fairly bright clouds, uh, but you got probably at least five or six hours, if not more, before that reaches us. So that's also good. Uh, but if you look carefully down here, there's these tiny warmer and therefore lower clouds here in Placentia Bay. Um, they don't seem too ominous, but usually when you see that, you start to wonder, oh, is there going to be stuff forming here in Conception Bay and in the other bays? And you can see a little bit, some tiny, tiny, if you look very careful, some tiny clouds there as well. And so if you're out tonight, if you see, you know, tiny low clouds drifting, that's the reason. But ultimately, it's not, you know, they're, they're not terrible. Ultimately, just by looking from this, the seeing, and the transparency should be excellent. Um, usually the reason for low transparency is either high cloud of the kind that you see clearing us right now or that's approaching or uh, fog or, or mist developing, which you can't typically see on satellite as easily. Uh, but there's neither of that. So transparency should be excellent, you know, in a dark sky. Um, you know, seeing should be pretty good too. Uh, there, there's other things that I'm going to show you next month uh, at the talk about how to look at seeing, but, um, you know, seeing should be decent. But yeah, it, it does look like a great night and I'm not going to take more time. 
uh, to explain this uh, because people probably want to head out. I will tell you what you can see in the sky tonight and over the next month or so. Um, so this is the document that's on our website and gets updated monthly. Um, this is a um, roundup of the sun-related phenomena with sunrise and sunset being, you know, the bigger ones. Sunsets at 7.07 uh, today, pretty late. Um, solar system bodies, rise and set time listed in this table. Current picture of the sun from today, a bunch of uh, sunspot groups. And there have been some pictures on the talk list. I think the latest one I saw was was showing this group pretty well, except it was inverted. So it was, I think it was around here. Uh, but, um, you know, the sun continues to be pretty active. In terms of planets, uh, Mercury is the only evening planet, but it does not do that until, you know, more like mid to late April when it actually reaches its best apparition for the year. So this will be the best time of the whole year to to see Mercury, but currently it's it's not visible. And then quite a bit going on in the morning with with the four of these planets uh, eventually joining together for a for a nice show. Uh, Venus uh, rises one to two hours before the sun, very similar to Mars. So they're very close together over the next little while. Saturn is a little bit behind those two, uh, maybe half an hour after. Venus and Mars, and then Jupiter is even farther, um, still kind of somewhat hidden in the sun's glare, uh, but it does reemerge from that solar conjunction in early April, you know, joining the, the gathering of these four planets. And on April 18th, if you want to mark that date, those four planets will be located in a fairly perfect line, almost nearly perfectly spaced apart so it should be very very nice picture and that will occur 45 minutes before sunrise in the east southeast okay comets nothing going on right now that's worth talking about uh asteroids five brightest asteroids uh and supernovae the brightest one being 1915 which is not very bright at all uh, meteor showers, the next one is on April 22nd, the Lyrid. Um, deep sky objects, here are the best ones for this time of year. The, the, we said it's galaxy season, so M66, that's the, one of the Leo triplets, prime targets this time of year. And for the observing challenge this month, I have a very topical one uh, with today's talk. It's an AGN. And specifically, it's a quasar. Okay, so the challenge is to see quasar two or three C two seventy three. So um, that one is is fairly well known. Uh, it's located at a staggering distance of two and a half billion light years away. Um, so the fact that it's visible, this makes it the most distant object in the sky that's visible to amateurs, which is uh, a great thing to put on your list. If you want to see the most distant thing that you can see with your equipment, that's it. Um, the, ma the magnitude is 12.9, which means that in a dark sky, it should be visible with a telescope um, as small as six inches, although I would recommend eight inches or uh, higher. Um, and the reason why such a distant object is visible is that it's exceptionally bright. Uh, four million, is this a trillion? Four million I, I billion. Think trillion. I think trillion. Four trillion times <laughs> the sun, okay? Uh, it's uh, from the picture that Chris showed earlier, that first picture in the presentation with the blazar. Um, I, I, would, I would imagine this one is much farther out and much brighter. Uh, but it's not a blazar because the, the jets are not intersecting our field of view. Uh, it's just a quasar. 
but of course, with how far it is, you're not going to see those things, and and they're obvious, and they're not visible um, in, in the visible spectrum. You'll just see a point. It, it will look like a star. So if you want to uh, complete this challenge, you'll need a star map to make sure that you're looking at the right thing. And Nikolai, and where what part of the sky is it in? Yeah, I'm about to show the. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's in Virgo uh, and very well placed this time of year. This is the best time of year to see it. Uh, it almost it forms almost a perfect equilateral triangle with um, Gamma and Eta uh, stars in Virgo. So you just go up from those two stars. That's right here. Hmm. Um, so it would be great if, you know, if you, if someone could take, try to take a picture of that and compare it with a star map to confirm, I think that would be fabulous. Um, I would call this challenge kind of medium difficulty. I have, I have seen this myself visually with my eight inch telescope. It's not necessarily a, um, difficult target. Um, just need a dark sky and you just need to know where to look. So, wow. uh, but a, Cool thing to to find. Cool. Um, International Space Station passes for the next little while. Observing sessions currently canceled, however, may be revived. Uh, this is the March calendar, and this is the April calendar. Um, and that should be it. Okay. Thank Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, Problem. And uh, so I'll just finish up here. Uh, so uh, a couple things. Can you see my screen there? Yep. So people might be interested. There's um, the Canadian Association of Physicists has um, a series of lectures every spring. Um, for they're sort of aimed at undergraduate students. And there's one coming up tomorrow. It'll be five o'clock our time. And it's by one of our friends at Western about, uh, and it's about uh, asteroids, why they're so interesting, why we worry about them. And the way that you can, they, they haven't posted the link yet, or they will probably post it tomorrow morning. And the, if you're interested, the way that you can get that is go to cap.ca. And um, there's a lot of stuff on that site, but you want to look for the 2022 lecture schedule. And there are six lectures, I think, in the series. I believe this is about the fourth one. And the Zoom link will be on that page. So, um, have a if you're interested to have a look see if you can find it um the other news item uh nikolai kind of already uh gave it away he's going to be the speaker next month um sort of expanding on what he started with uh tonight um how to tell what's going on up there and um it's a little bit early, but I'll just mention that uh, International Astronomy Day is coming up on May 7th. And um, we do have a go ahead to do it at the Geo Center. And so I guess it'll probably be in the afternoon. We'll try and set up uh, um, some telescope displays, some uh, information, an information table, maybe some solar viewing. And if people have questions about new telescopes and new equipment, um, that's a good place to come in and ask. And um, hopefully everything will still be good in May. So that's sort of the um, formal part of the meeting. Um, but if people want to stick around for a few minutes, although Nikolai's told us it's nice out now, so um, you don't need to stick around. You can run outside right away. Um, but if people had, you know, if there's some visitors that had questions about their equipment or anything else, um, a few of us can stick around for a few minutes and um, answer questions. Are, are there any other things that anyone would like to 
talk about. Uh, Mike, you mentioned the, uh, the Webb telescope image. Yes. Um, I, mean, I saw a, it was on Twitter and it was, it didn't say which star it was, um, but they had focused in, it was just a test shot. And so there was a, it was centered on a star. You could see diffraction spikes and you could see a galaxy in the background. Okay. So it was one star and some other objects in the background, but it, um, I guess it's meant to indicate that they're now getting very close to being um, focused, but I, I saw it on Twitter. I guess it must be somewhere, probably if you went to the web telescope page, it would be there, but. Oh, okay. I, I was just wondering if you had it queued up to, to view. They've been yeah pulling those 18 mirrors uh, into uh, alignment over the last month or so. And uh, uh, yeah, cool. I'll have to have. Yeah, so it's the, let me just have a quick look and see if it's uh, anywhere near the top of my. Uh, Oh, Peggy uh, writes in the chat window, um, the uh, new image centers on star two mass, uh, J1755-4042, uh, plus 6551-277. So that's 17 hours, 55 minutes, right ascension, and plus 65 degrees, 51 minutes declination. So it's uh, up in the northern sky. And... Um, I can't okay, well, thank, thanks for uh, picking that out. Thanks, thanks, Peggy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not finding it in my Twitter feed. I just saw it uh, before the meeting, so. I bought those numbers in Starry Night uh, uh, on my uh, uh, laptop here, but it didn't show anything. Uh, like uh, where it was, it didn't, it said it wasn't there or whatever. It did. I oh, then, that, uh, Randy just, Randy was just showing us the, uh, the image. You want to do that again, Randy? Yeah. So there it is there. Oh yeah. Uh, you got to stop oh. sharing your, uh, uh, your page, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, so Randy, do it one more time. Okay. This is on the uh, the James Webb site, right? Sorry, it's on my phone. So. Uh... They're getting there. It's cool. So, anyways, that's that's pretty exciting. There. Yeah, that's good. Um, so, any other comments or questions that people have? You mentioned uh, Herschel. Yes. I think today is Caroline's birthday. That's right. You're right. I, I did see that somewhere too. So I'll eat the uh, remainder of my coconut cream pie for her today. <laughs> okay. She, she, uh, I guess she did a lot of, she did some of the mirrors for him. And, and one she, of the things I, it, it was interesting. The, the, um, I didn't really know it was the anniversary of the discovery of Uranus until CBC got in touch wanting to talk about it. Um, but I, I looked up a little bit about it. And one of the interesting things about Herschel's telescope was that <coughs> and they were using speculum, which is metal mirrors, I guess, and trying to do the so it's a ref he had a reflector, um, seven foot focal length, six inch, a little bit more than six inch um, aperture, but trying to uh, use a secondary mirror like in a normal Newtonian reflector, um, there's a lot of losses when you're using a speculum mirror. So his telescopes apparently um, didn't have a secondary mirror. The um, primary mirror was tilted a little bit so that you could sort of look in off axis and see things. And I guess that's called a Herschel type telescope. So I didn't know anything about that. Uh, your uh, interview was on the CBC 
podcast website. If you just search for CVC podcasts and search for Radio Noon, you'll find it. It's, it was right at the top of the show. So Yeah. And uh, referred to the mirror or the telescope as being cobbled together, but I think that telescope was sort of pretty leading edge technology yeah. in 1781. So uh-huh. I uh, gave him a little bit of a hard time about saying cobbled together. Uh, event- eventually, Herschel tried making one that was uh, and it was hard. He had to have a way to rotate it and change the elevation. He eventually tried making one that was um, 40 feet, 40 foot focal length, but that one never worked right. But he, he did go bigger than the seven foot one. He That, that did work well. Yeah, it's an interesting story. It is- he set up his telescope when he discovered Uranus on the streets in front of his house because he couldn't see it from his backyard. Yeah, you could say he was one of the first uh, sidewalk astronomers. I was uh, to his house uh, and uh, did the tour and that. It was quite interesting. She would, uh, he would look through the telescope and he would dictate and she would write the notes with a candle and ink next to him. But I read that she also did some of the mirror grinding. Yes, she did, which was down in the basement. That's how they got out into their backyard. It wasn't a very, you know, at all the houses around it was more like up. I don't know how he got to see to make such a great uh, map of the sky from his back. I guess he did a lot of it from the front. It was interesting. He probably had a big backyard, too. No. Nope, the houses were very close together. I was quite surprised. Really? Okay. And, and oh yeah, of course. Like, and down deep, right? What, what city was this? Street. Bath. Bath, 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 England. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. on the west side of England. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was, it, was the telescope still there? Uh, not, not the original, but a model of it was. Yes. And they had some. Uh, Mirrors made with the, the thing on display there. So what did the mirrors look like? Uh, they just looked like pieces of glass. Some were metal, actually, I thought. Yeah, that, that, and, I, I was and wondering it, about the metal ones, how and, and, and it was just were. a coating on it, you know? And that coating uh, uh, seemed to be... But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's, if you ever get in the bath, take the tour. It's quite interesting. It's over near Stonehenge, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I went. (laughs) Did they get into any trouble with, because if they were casting metal, sometimes, you know, back in the old days. Mad Hatters. um, Casting metal, you get fumes that are not good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I suspect speculum is uh, some sort of alloy of metal, some of which are not very nice. Yeah, I think but, speculum has mercury in it. So yeah, I was gonna say that. Did they run into any trouble? Because <laughs> I mean, he had quite a long life, right? I have yeah. an answer for Peggy, who asked, "Where in the sky we look to see where the Webb Telescope? It's very close to the Cat's Eye Nebula in Draco." Mm-hmm. I just looked it up in Stellarium. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not planning on working with uh, speculum metal anytime soon. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, but... if um, if there's no other questions, we can maybe uh, call it a night, and people can get out and look at Nikolai's sky. Mm-hmm. Yes. Either that or sleep. I was up until two in the morning last night. Ah. Uh. Paddy's Day tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, yes. So uh, Sheila's brush is Sunday, I think. Is it this time? (laughs) That Sunday storm keeps changing. Now it's rain and snow. Oh, Oh, dear. And the wind has gone up a bit, I think. Right, Nikolai? Doesn't look too bad. Nah, 75K and 10 centimeters of snow. Ah, We can handle that. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Boy, that was something the weekend. Oh, man. Yeah, I broke off my uh, solar uh, panel that yep. kept my light uh, for about 10 years. I, wow. I had a solar panel and a light. Yep. The light's still there, but the solar panels hit the car. Broke it off. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, th we, th we, thanks, we guys. I was oh, just going to say thanks, as Keith. Okay, uh, Keith. Chris has a great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it, and uh, well, thanks. Got a tremendous amount of information there. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. Good night. Bye, bye. Good night, Keith. Keith. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Gone, Good gone. Night. Good night. Okay. Cheers. Chum, chum, chum. Here we all go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stopping. <laughs> okay. <laughs>